get real advice from renowned experts and entrepreneurs on today's business leaders. Here's your host, Gabe Arnold. All right, on today's episode, I have Vinny Fisher. He is the founder of Fully Accountable, and he is a brilliant uh, digital strategist, good guy, amazing entrepreneur, and somebody that I've gotten to know uh, in the last couple of months pretty well. Um, and I'm super excited to have you on the show today, Vinny. So thank you for the time. Oh, Gabe, okay, thanks. I, uh, I love that we, you and I are developing a relationship and we get to go ahead and then live out part of that in front of everybody live. That's so awesome. So thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when did you first realize that you were an entrepreneur? Oh, you know, my brother doesn't like this story, but it's just true. You know, he, uh, my brother is bigger. We have different dads. And uh, so he was always a little more athletic, maybe not much more, but enough where like there was a difference in the athleticism. And uh, he broke his arm in football while also having this paper route. And he kind of got it handed to him. I can't recall. I was young, but so he was down. Well, I took over the paper out while he was down because I was filling in. Well, in the process of filling in, I did it better. And so I kind of won over the paper out from my brother. And it kind of like started this like, hey, I can do this stuff. Like I, if, I, if I see something that I can do that like I, I, be, I realized I'm a problem solution type person. So I see problems all the time, not in a negative way, things that I want to fix. And so I'm always trying to solve problems. And if you look at all of my history in business, it's literally a solution to some type of problem that I would have identified mostly for myself. I think there's a ton of wisdom in that. Because I, there's two with entrepreneurship being trendy right now, which mm. conceptually I'm not opposed to. However, trends always scare me. <laughs> or popular things scare me a little bit or make me nervous about what's going to happen yeah. when it isn't trend anymore. But with the current trend of entrepreneurship, unfortunately, in my book, there's too many people that are looking for a passion project or they're showing up in the wrong way or in, maybe in an ineffective way instead of doing what you just said of like, here's a problem. Can I solve that? I'll solve the problem. That's entrepreneurship 101. And I know how you feel because, um, I could walk into a restaurant, uh, auto repair shop, and yeah. have a plant for a doctor's office and be like, oh my God, they should totally fix that piece. Or like, that's not right. Or we could do that better. So I, I, I can't turn it off either. So I could yeah. relate to that. <laughs> um, and so how, how old were you when you stole the paper out? <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, that's a great question. Just under 10. So I was like nine and change. And I remember I had like double sack bag with the bike and it was really meant for like the 14 year old that my brother was. And, but I just like hustled it. I like tripled the tips this Christmas season. And my brother, like apparently under the system of mafia thought I needed to share back and pay to the King. So I had to give him his amount, not because I felt obligated because I think he was just going to beat me up if I didn't. And so I learned the risk allocation of the being the worker on someone else's team in that process too. So I'll yeah. tell you though, back on your point about the value. And one of the things early on is a kind of, as I grew up into my young adult life and always had this entrepreneurial spirit about me, Early on, I, I, I had to come to grips with, and I still have to recognize and deal with this, that I didn't always set out to just solve problems. Lots of times I, like, I, I saw like there was a hole or something in the market that I was clever enough to sell. And so I had this stage in my life where I was selling things. I wasn't always filling in a value proposition. I was kind of like taking advantage of my cleverness to sell something. And I don't know that I was moving the value needle. So I would say that one of the things I fought through and continue to fight over time is I've gotten better at problem solution as it relates to having a value proposition in my solution, not just that I was clever enough to hack something up and sell it. Yeah, that's a good point too, because there's plenty of you know, one and done or one hit wonder businesses that just jump on a very temporary trend, which is kind of what we we're touching on earlier. Yeah. Those are tough businesses to sustain and somebody always gets hurt. And in my experience, when you look at, you know, boom and bust of like crypto, or you look at yeah. as an example, I mean, and there's, and I know people that do very well there and it's uh, very ethical and are adding value to the world. Yep. However, it's a, it's a smaller portion than what, you know, what was happening. And, I'm curious how now that you've kind of done both sides of, of you know, the scenario where there yeah. were definitely 
and we'll talk about your existing business in a minute here because it solves a huge problem, which I, I love um, and really adds value. Now that you've done that side and you've done the kind of, oh, I can make money there option that's fallen in, in front of you, how do you now look at opportunities and, and essentially vet out or do due diligence to say, you know what, I can make money and this creates value. Is there a criteria in your head or are there principles that you use there? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. And I, I, I want to say this for everybody. I, I appreciate you taking some time to listen. And I love that question. And I, I look at business as seasons and we're each in a season of life. So for me, I've come to define seasons as like a five-year thing. And then I see a first and a second half to the season. So like think uh, you're in the middle of a season at any given time, wherever you're at. And so the reason I wanted to put that framing in your head was like, I think it's important to always hear the advice you get from somebody in the season you're in. And, and I got to do my best to recognize the season I'm in as I talk to everybody. And so for me, I don't think each business and what thing it does is the value proposition I think it's my relationship first and foremost to it. So for example, when we had our info publishing business and that was a fun way of selling, we sold business opportunities. Like, and, and, and there was a fun term called biz op. I had an awful relationship to the concept of our biz op business. Cause I didn't, I always thought of it as not, not offering value. Now there were guys in that space who love, and I still know them who are in the business opportunity space and they love it. And they wake up every day wanting to make it better. And they're really good at it. Well, they have a value proposition of something they're trying to offer. I had a cash grab attitude about it. So it was my relationship to it that really does matter. And so when I'm looking now at opportunities, that's first and foremost part of it. Like there are first off non-negotiable things because of who in my relationship, first for me to Christ, second to my wife and my kids, they're just things I won't do. Now that's just personal to me. But in addition to that, there are things that like, like, will I see it be valuable or will I be excited to get involved in it? And I'm looking if anyone else sees value in it, do I? And then third for me now, I, um, I wake up every day having a gazillion ideas. I don't need another job. So I'm investing in the development of team. So I have three operating companies that, I, that we own. I'm the CEO of Fully Accountable, but I also own two other companies. And I actually have a third one that's a fourth one, actually, a third one beyond that, that's starting. I'm developing teams. I really am developing that COO and also other leaders. So each of those companies have an, a team. And I spend my time there in this season of my life, but it does not change my value equivalent. Like I don't want to just go side hustle, help build a team for something at the end of the day that I can't relate or mindset wise kind of connect with the passion that's in me to the value proposition of whatever we're trying to do. And so if I was going to do a biz op company, and I was back in that sales hustle where I had a very negative relationship to the value proposition that I would say I would pass on that opportunity. But if I loved the business opportunity, I thought it was really cool and it fit a spot. And for me now, I had a team and an operator that I could go invest my own money in and time, then I would look at the opportunity. That's a good answer. That's super helpful. I appreciate that because there's, I've seen people launch all types of businesses, the side hustles, the small things like, I know some people that open vineyards and which is not the most profitable thing in the world to do from what I understand. However, they really passionate about it. They love it and they create an amazing experience and it's great for them and it's for the clients. And then, you know, there's other people that I've seen obviously like take over a family business or get into something because it, they thought it was their only option or there was some kind of scarcity there and then they're miserable and the business doesn't do well and they don't do well. And there's nothing wrong with the business model. It's like, it's a very successful business model. Yeah, I mean, I'll be real, Gabe. Like, listen, go back to 09. My partner at the time, he and I, we were like, literally, it's to date the largest thing I've actually created. And for about a six month period, we were doing nine figures in run rate. We were doing north of 10 million runs in run rate in the door. So yeah. imagine how many moving parts this thing had. Yeah. I woke up miserable every day because I hated funny. the business. And yeah. one day I walked into his room and I said, hey, one of two things are happening today. I'm either, um, you're either buying me out or we're selling the company. And his response was awesome. He's like a buddy and I love him. And he's like, who are we selling it to? <laughs> 
Nice. And I just, now though, looking back with a little bit of maturity, I see nothing wrong with the category of the business. The problem I had is it, it did not, that's like when, if you really evaluate your relationship to some of your companies, you're going to break them. If you really don't have this, like get through, like there's something that's feeding your soul more than just your checkbook. Yeah. Yeah. That's very wise. I just finished reading. It reminds me of what uh, I was reading, uh, leading with soul. Ooh, and it talks a lot that. about how in order to really be successful in business, we have to bring spirit and soul and like the spiritual end of life into business. Cause that's a huge part of our lives. And it, it really hit me. And th- there was a line in the beginning of the book that said right now, you know, corporations around the world are starved for spirit and soul. Mm-hmm. Like, and so they're struggling and they're pretending that this isn't a part of who we are as humans. And then, work becomes more meaningless instead of becoming more meaningful. Um, and, and that's, I just think that's really wise advice. I've never thought about, I have never looked at it from that angle of saying, okay, do I want to get in this business because it connects to my heart, you know, and then look at the dollars, like, cause we can't go broke doing things. Over yeah. And, over. and by the way, it, it, maybe it starts in that first part of the season. Yeah. For, like if I'm honestly evaluating it, maybe my first move is to make sure it doesn't violate rules of my heart maybe it doesn't maybe i don't have this like super deep connection but does it violate it so like you know my daughter and i are passionate about like children and slavery and things about trafficking and so i would never at this point thank god ever open up some type of sexual business exploiting children like it would violate parts of my heart now i'm not I, i gave an extreme example Right. But I can come up with less extreme examples. So maybe my first move of advice is I don't have a, a violation to like things that would, so it's like never going to have a chance to feed my soul. Maybe right. it's not like this massively passionate thing. Like I love the health supplement space, right? Yeah. We own a health supplement company. I started in it. It started in my health journey where I was starting to have a better relationship to what I put in my body. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Hey, I can make money selling health supplements. And so I really kind of enjoy it. I have no negative relationship to it now. I don't really want to sell male enhancement pills, Mm -hmm. not because there's anything wrong with them, but I'm never going to wake up excited about some of that stuff. Like I just, I don't, uh, uh, there, but there are, are real impotence issues. It's just not the thing that we do. And and I don't have a problem with it, but I'm not going to wake up getting real excited about making that business better because it's got like this disconnect. I think it's like more of that than it is this like external universal. We all think that business is good or it sucks. Yeah. I don't care less about the person standing next to me at church and their opinion than I do about where I stand with Christ in my heart on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it reminds me of something that my friend Brian Kurtz says a lot. He's like, he's like, for some people in this group and this mastermind I'm in with them, he's like, what some of you do, you would be uncomfortable with, or you may consider unethical. And that's a little bit of a stretch in the language, but he's like, you may not like it. He's like, and then other people, it's completely fine with how they operate. And he encourages the same thing of like, really get, you know, in touch with how you feel and what you're comfortable with. Um, And that, that's why the advice, I, I think it's taken me until only recently in the last couple of years to start to understand what you're talking about of seasons, which I really like. That's a great way to frame up like where you are. I mean, five years is an interesting timeline too. I've, you've never mentioned that to me before, but I like that. Um, and then the second piece being, Hey, if I don't hold back some of this stuff, then how am I going to, you're going to, I got to give you Kung Fu Panda out by a little bit. It's like, otherwise I shoot it all out in the first shot. And then we're like, what? It's nothing. That's good. Exactly. And then the other piece is just really realizing that what's right for me is it has nothing to do with everybody else. Like it's, okay. you know, it's, it's got a, it's got a line for me. So that's, that's awesome. Um, I just got done having like a kind of a professional talk with all of our CFOs. And one of the things we do is offer fractional CFO as part of our uh, service. It's the higher end part of our package. And I, I was talking to them about the idea of professionalism. We had a training today and I said, okay, there's really two parts to being an amazing professional. And they're all like, what are they? What's he going to tell us? And I'll tell everybody, it's the same secret to being a good entrepreneur. One is you actually have to see yourself and have a right identity to your value. Because there's so much noise out there telling you the opposite, loneliness, shame, brokenness. Like I have to have a relationship to how I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and where I'm valuable. 
And then yeah. the second thing is I got to, if I don't value my time, why would I expect anyone else to? And so I'm always having to battle those two components. And to me, when I look at this discussion, I say that to people like, if you really want to really, really, really start to look at the seasons of your life and appreciate some of that, start to get a relationship to your identity and what really what bad language that pours out of your mouth that you're so abusive towards yourself. And the second thing is watch how much you don't value your time by giving it to everybody. Yeah, that's good advice. And that's, that's heavy hitting. Cause you're right. Like, I think for me, I've realized quite a few years ago, fortunately, I figured out a piece of the identity aspect of that, that I've, that I've practiced and continue to improve and focus on. Cause I, I'm super conscious of how I speak to myself in my head and out loud and everything. Cause it, I listen to myself. So I have to be careful what I say to myself, obviously. And so simple example that I, that I use with people on the health front when they're talking to me about like, you know, things like that. I, I tell people one day I woke up and I said, I am not a person that drinks pop. And I stopped that day. And, that. and that's, I can, um, it reminds me similar to like you're, you walked in your partner's office and said, we're selling or you're buying me out. Like I make shifts and decisions on that front pretty quickly where I've continuing to grow and improve is I am not as cautious as I am going to be going forward, or I haven't been on how I share my time. And I think it where it's tripped me up is that it comes from a place as I really do want to serve and help people, yep. but it's taken me many years to realize that I'm actually hurting people when I don't charge them for my time or I'm not really, you know, protective of it because it'll get squandered and wasted and not valued and, you know, pearls before. Yeah, and I, Gabe, I love you to pieces. You're like really cool. And you know, and I, we're getting closer and for, I'll be real. Like for everyone listening, I, I have, I, I love helping people. I'm like you. I just like inherently like, like somebody and I want to help them and I want to keep going. I think there's a gift of hospitality in that. I think it's a good thing. So when I hear these guys who are ridiculously amazing at guarding their schedule and like you get one minute on the 31st go, like I have a negative resistance to my personality that not that they're doing something wrong. It just doesn't fit for me. It doesn't sound kind. So right. I had to learn first that I'm actually more of a yes person and no is a problem for me. So I had to learn things like in order to say no, the first step to no was like, no, not right now, or this isn't a good time for me. Or now like someone's, you know, the classic way that the world takes time from you is like, Hey, you got a minute for, we can catch up. I used to be like, yeah, sure. And now like, as I have a better relationship to time, I battle this every day, by the way, the world will always come back. You got to be the one battling for it. And now I'll say stuff like, Hey, what is it you'd like to talk about? So I've pushed the exchange back to make yeah. you give me a thing you want to talk about. It'll, it'll unearth disguise, disguise things that we aren't really talking. It's a, maybe it's a sales call or it's a whatever it'll unearth whether they really want to talk or they don't know what they want to talk about, or it'll help them get their thoughts together so that when we do talk, it's a better conversation. And so I love that, you know, it's every better like in church or wherever for me, it's always seems to be church. And that dude walks up to you and they say, Oh my gosh, Hey Vinny, I want to talk to you. I hear you're a great business guy. I'm like, okay, cool. What do you want to talk about? And they're like, I'm just really like looking for a job. I'm like, oh, cool. What kind of job are you looking for? Like, I just want to help people. <laughs> I wish it was that simple. <laughs> but that way that you and I have a relationship to how people's marketing sounds is actually an honest indictment of how I give out my time. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely, that's the lesson I'm in the middle of is using my time wisely. And like, as you're talking about that, I was thinking, well, maybe I should, you know, I do want to give my time. Like I still feel that like, maybe I should, maybe I should just open up certain times where I am open and it's, you know, free for all or whatever. But, but I, do. You know, I used to have a really bad resistance to yeah. like, let's say you reached out to me, say, Hey Vin, I want to catch up. Right. You know, I have a, like a schedule link to get on my calendar and I've right. got a block of time that's open to those types of meetings. Right. And I used to have a, 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 a mind relationship to my own self by me sending you that link that I'm somehow making myself more important to make you sign up for a time slot. When in reality, it's the most loving thing I can do for you and me by being like efficient to get a slot on the board instead of doing the, you know, when would you like to meet? When would you like to meet? When you, like I had this awful relationship to the who's better than who by sending out the link. Literally, yeah. as the more I become aware of protecting my time, I see what the lack of it looks like. And so most of it is habit. 
to be honest with you. I think people will tell you that the most valuable thing they have is time. And it's the first thing they give away. Because for me, I feel like I got to be kind. And so what are ways to be kind? Well, being loving and kind doesn't mean I can't be clear and direct. Yeah. I just, I start doing that better. And all of a sudden they appreciate it. I appreciate it. Time is a scarce commodity. And yeah. if that's true, well, then if I value it, the person who wants it from me will value it. Now, maybe I don't always charge for my time. And that's not a thing. I don't actually charge my time thing, but maybe there are people who do and they got to be careful about how they do that. But it's, it's equally or more valuable to me about why I'm giving the time away. So I had to learn kindness factors in the way my personality delivers it. But it, by honest truth, the more I guard it, the more I really have margin to invest in the things that um, I think I'm supposed to be investing in. Yeah. And that's something, well, you just said something that is something that I really admire about you and has been awesome connecting because you are incredibly direct and incredibly kind. And that's something that I've had to, that I'm continuing to work on and improve. And, uh, you know, I haven't always been, I've been direct most of my life, but maybe not always kind. <laughs> and, and, and you're right. It's like, if we're, if we really respect people's time, then we can, we can show up that way and, and be respectful on both sides. I think that's great advice. And it's, as you grow a company and, and you know, even better than me, you know, with the experience you have, but your time continues to become scarcer and scarcer and scarcer and everybody thinks they need it. And if you run that way, then you actually start imploding your company. So it's um, funny. I told this professional meeting today, I said, there's two down world, worldly pressures that will never change as a good professional. And I think of an entrepreneur, I have a very much a fiduciary relationship to my own company. I think we were professionals, right? And so there's two downward pushes by the world that's always existed and they just keep getting worse. Downward pressure, number one, is this constant burden to always be right perfect in every delivery mechanism we do. And then everything from that falls off that. And the other downward pressure is to always be available. Those are the two things that we have to manage constantly as a good professional, this burden that is a lie and we have to always be right and perfect. And then the other burden that we always have to be available. We got to guard against both of those in the continual aspect of being whatever professional we're being asked to be. Yeah. And yeah, it's like, I look at my calendar as an open slot and I'm like, oh yeah, I can <laughs> do that. And it's like, I, uh, you end up stealing from yourself and that's a great way to create poverty in the long run. Oh my gosh. Oh, I, and you know, it's funny. Like, let's be honest. I, I give myself the most benefit of the doubt. Like I didn't work out this morning and Glenn, if he's our trainers listening, going, I knew you didn't. And <laughs> I didn't, and I didn't, I, but I'm like, oh, right, come on, buckaroo. You'll, you'll work out tomorrow. I'm also the same guy that will be massively hard on myself. Why didn't you work out? How lazy are you? What's your problem? Like, yeah. and so that same head trash goes in both directions. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely. I, I never heard of what you what you just mentioned. Those two pressures is definitely something that is good to be aware of because one, you're not going to be right all the time. If maybe if you're right half the time, you're doing all right, <laughs> and so there's no point in aiming for something that doesn't exist. And then yeah, saying trying to be always available, I think has the pressure there. I think is obviously built the more technology develops and advances, which is such a gift. However, I think that adds pressure. Oh. You know, I think it's funny, as a parent, I learned through humility, uh, this like kind of fig leaf perfection thing as an entrepreneur. And I had to like approach my children and apologize and recognize offenses where I like didn't show up as a dad or wasn't a good husband in certain situations. And so practicing humility with your children, man, you want to like learn how to actually be a more effective leader, like bring your offenses to people and like apologize for the things where you fall short whoa, yeah. you'll get wonderful opportunities to lead if you do that stuff. Yeah, that's definitely good advice. So shifting a little bit, I want to talk about fully accountable and, um, you know, what you put something in the notes that you sent over, you talk about, you know, you help e-commerce tech and digital business owners improve their financial fluency and operate, you know, their accounting back office yeah. as a profit center. And I, I recorded an episode on my solo show this morning that I haven't put out yet and talked about how, you're insane if you don't have, you know, you, or maybe not this, <laughs> you're, you're going to fail if you, or you're going to super struggle if you don't have financial intelligence and partners with CPA, CFOs, you know, the support there. Um, and also I'll add this and then I want to hear just more about how you guys operate and what you do. Um, 
it has been a struggle running a digital business to get help. Like we, you know, we do have good partners now, but it's not as easy as running a contracting business or, you know, professional, you know, firms like there, there has been a struggle with us of finding people that get what we do first and then also can give us resources and support like banking, financial guidance. And like, cause it's not like running a retail shop, yeah. um, you know, we're digital. So I love what you guys are up to. And I'd love to hear about how that started and like who you're serving, and what you help with. I oh, appreciate that. So one of the things I'd love to do before I dive deep into that is we'll, we'll go ahead and create this link real time right now, but at fullyaccountable.com forward slash Gabe, we'll call it that. Okay. Because he's awesome. And we'll make it after him. I want to give you a bunch of resources away. One of the resources is are my two books. One of them is called The CEO's Mindset and the other one's called False Profits. All you gotta do is go opt in, we'll give them to you, okay? But why am I doing it? Because growing a business is ridiculously hard and all the things to do it is like parenting. I, I have a 19 year old now. Well, what do I have? What do I know about raising a 20 year old? I don't know anything. I'm gonna figure it out when I get there. Well, business can be a lot like that. And so it, I will have shared journey of stuff in business that I would have learned. Well, one of the big ones that I learned was the back office infrastructure of a company. The side hustle, good marketing, offer writing stuff that I'm good at, like is like six figure hustle stuff. Once an offer starts to gather momentum and, you know, and in seven figure mode or late six figure mode, like you got other things like people and stuff and things and all of a sudden, what might not be important about having a converting offer might be the fact that I keep more of the money we have coming or I have like this structure to me and I have consistency and excellence and all the stuff I didn't sign up for. Well, that happened in my house, it happened in my health supplement company. Broken, we're selling a great product. I have all this mess going on and I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're actually almost a mid eight figure company. And every month, I would be like, we got all this revenue coming in and razor thin money left at the bottom. I'm like, where's it all going? Where, where's it all going? And I had this awful relationship to words and accounting and stuff. And, and I'm a trained accountant with a tax specialty. And I was afraid of some of those terms. And so what I do is just keep growing more sales, growing more sales. And I, what I would never do is spend any time trying to defend the profit margin. So one day I'm like, that's it. I just like, I, I would say more than just a light bulb more. I'm like a softening of my heart where I'm like, it's not about the money I like bring in. It's about what we keep. And I know that sounds basic to many of you, but that changed my life for me. And that's what led to the book, False Profits. And that's what, was what led to the changing of how I run business where all of a sudden I want to be a defender of a profit margin. What was 8% now suddenly I, I realize I'm supposed to be 22%. I became like this rabid dog fighting for those 14 points. Well, I started realizing, holy crap, growing up as a leader in a business, there are other parts to a company. Just because I suck at parts of them doesn't mean they don't exist and doesn't mean they don't need to be done. And so I learned just enough of those areas where I could manage and effectively uh, operate them. So one of the things that's happened over time is technology keeps catching up. I don't need to be an expert in all the areas, but I have to be aware of them and I have to actually have right resources in the right place. So while we were doing that, I realized one was missing. Old school accounting wasn't filling in for high transactions as it relates to the way we do business on the internet. And yeah. so I wanted to fix that. So I started fixing it for my own companies. And the next thing you know, my buddies were like, dude, that's really cool. So here we are six years later, we offer our fractional CFO and controller service where we are the entire back office, those four accounting positions for e-commerce and digital companies doing seven figures in revenue. Now we work with agencies that are above half a million revenue, but they have a different relationship where they can start to see growth differently than a product business might be at seven figures. But the fact is still the same. There's a whole bunch of stuff. There's somebody that's got to do that. And a dashboard doesn't solve that problem. Problem. Now, tech helps, but good night. I figured out a way to have all four of those people packaged into a service where it's the cost and less than one of them doing it at a really high level. And we just started doing that. Now, every day we got a little better at it, add a little more people to it. And next thing you know, we serve hundreds of people and we have this big company. And every day we get the privilege to add something better to it and fix it. But like I never set out, I'll be honest with you, I was solving a problem for myself and I never thought I'd be having this like big thing. They're hard to grow, but once you get into a certain point, they're kind of hard to break. Yeah. 
That's awesome. What so specifically? What when you talk about the four roles that yeah. that you fill inside of it? What are those? Break those yeah, down. So uh, I I didn't learn this. I would hire a CFO and think I, all my problems were solved. I'd pay this guy 150, 200 grand, and he'd solve all my problems. All of a sudden, he hated me. I hated him because I didn't know there are four positions. There's a bookkeeper. There's a data analyst. There's a controller, which is the accountant, and there's a CFO. There's a guy who's kind of above the work. Well, I'd pay the guy or gal above the work and expect him or her to do all the things because I didn't know what the things were. I thought it was just like doing the work. Yeah. Holy cow, all four of those positions matter in a high transactions business. And so we do all four of those. And those are really important, but we run it from the quarterback of the accountant. Now, the controller and a CFO are not the same. They don't think the same. They don't act the same. I know there are people who claim to do what we do, who like act like those are the same thing. Those aren't the same thing. And we have a bunch of both of those people on our team and they sit in different categories. And so what I had to get a relationship to was realizing that my business needs to have a formal aspect to the accounting and finance department. And the first thing I learned was that's the smartest tax thing I could do was to create a relationship to the business. So I get a first shot at the tax and then anything that flows to me and Debbie, I get a second shot at the tax. I wish someone would have told me that 10 years ago. And so I just started growing up on it. Well, that's what we do, right? We're not, we have fancy tools. We just take advantage of time, money, and resources. We do it in a way effective use of time that you don't have for a way effective cost and bring way bigger toys to the table than it's worth you investing in. That's awesome. That's a good breakdown. I think you're right. Yeah. I've had the the privilege of working in some really big businesses, you know, as a vendor or being part of them over the years. And yeah, your CFO and your controller and your bookkeeper are hundred percent different roles. And I and I knew that from over 10 years ago. However, of course, in my business, I thought it'd be fun to ignore that for a while. <laughs> and and it makes it really hard when you jam all that together. And but, yep. but in fairness, Gabe, like I mean, like just to like give yourself the benefit of the doubt, you hire this great lady, and I we call her Mary around here, and you bring her on the team, and she's killing it, she's doing everything. Well, the business starts to grow up. Right. The problem is the habit that you and I got into to getting it to one spot. We have to go like guarding our time through this like habit overhaul. What got me into seven figures is going to be different, and so you got to. My wife said I've had a glow up. I've lost like thirty pounds, and and like I look better. Well, you kind of have to have a glow up in your business. Like you have to improve things. And one of the lies being told in the world, like when we're a little younger, we want like this eight figure version of some things we're not ready for. It's a seasonal thing. But you've got to be improving aspects of your business. And I think the beauty of technology is you can outsource chunks of this stuff now. You can go buy access to expertise. With this shutdown that's gone on, our number one objection used to be, oh, we would really love to have that CFO in our building. That's gone. Yep. That objection is completely gone. And so our controller service and our, our fractional CFO, we're exploding in work because like that objection has realized that they just want expertise. Right. Yeah. No, tech tech has made all of this so much easier. And like I've told people like five years ago, we I closed my office because I wasn't going there anymore at all. And, and so it makes a big shift. Now it's easy because everybody knows how to get on a video call and it's, yeah. it's a lot more accessible. So yeah, there's ton, there's always tons of, amazing opportunities. And, and yeah, I, I, you know, I always want to remind people and everybody listening that in my personal experience, I have never lost a single dollar on hiring financial expertise. I've, I always make money when I bring in financial expertise, when I, you know, brought in my CPA, you know, that made me $25,000 that year. Nice. It, it didn't cost me a dime. Like, yes, I pay his fees, but it didn't cost anything. And like, I, I always encourage people when you, when you're really trying to scale, you definitely need to bring in real experts because otherwise you keep attempting to learn lessons that maybe that aren't even yours to learn, like on picking up a skill set that you shouldn't do. And I, you know, making a mess of something only sets back your momentum and cost your time and um, things like that. So yeah, it's, um, I just love that, you know, you guys have that and, and have that all covered. And yeah, and I can't do any of it. I mean, really clear. I set out to solve a problem I had. Yeah. Right. And so full circle, this business was created to solve a problem that I have. Now, the reason I want to say that is I want to be loving to everyone listening. Mm -hmm. You go through seasons. Like, listen, I had a almost nine figure web hosting company that I tragically broke and wrote a book about. Okay. I literally almost did that to a health supplement company that we subsequently sold and fixed. 
Yeah. The relationship to the past. I just wasn't ready for it. Mm -hmm. I, I, the seasons weren't there. So find a way to like get reconciled and forgiveness to yourself about things that are waste or in the past, but you can also change the trajectory of where you're heading and things you can deal with by not continuing to repeat that behavior. And so that's what I'm really thankful for is that I got like the light bulb went on that this was important. Cause what I notice about people in business is the, the guy or gals who, who kind of get that they're the ones investing and wanting to fix this. The yeah. ones who aren't are like kind of having a almost like dashboard relationship to the back end of their business. And you're going to, you're destined to kind of keep repeating that behavior. Yeah. If you look at the surface level data and don't really dive in, then you'll definitely keep looping around in that space. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate you coming on Vinny. I, I love what you guys do. I like who, you know, I appreciate who you are and how you show up. I, I always learn a ton from you and um, just really value you. So thank you for the time. And I highly encourage everybody to check out Vinny's business fully accountable. And we will have in the show notes as well. You can go to fully accountable.com forward slash Gabe. Vinny is generously giving away some amazing resources there, which I would encourage you guys to check out and we'll definitely have you back on soon. So thank you so much. All right, buddy. Thanks for having me. This show is brought to you by Today's Business Leaders. Learn more at our website, todaysbusinessleaders.com. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify today.